All right. Um, so, uh, when we did interaction, uh, what we basically learned how to do is take a variable and move um, a shape or change the size or change the color through input from the mouse. And animation is basically doing the same thing, but instead of taking the user input, we're going to actually create the changing value. Um, and we're going to animate it with specific parameters. Um, and so that's kind of the difference between doing an animation versus an interaction. Um, so to start, we're just going to start with a, a simple shape on our canvas. Um, I'm going to start with a comment as usual. So uh, this is animation example one, and this is 321. And so I'm going to kind of build this up through these examples. There's going to be some examples that are a little bit different from what I'm going to do, but it's all kind of the same basic stuff. So let's just start with a shape. Um, I'll start with an ellipse. And I'll put it at uh, 200, 200, and I'll make it 50 pixels wide. OK, so we've got an ellipse in the middle of our screen. And so what we want to do is animate it. OK, so what we can do is change one of these different properties. And as we talked about when we talked about variables, there's no way to, for me to change this number the way that it's currently written. 200 is just always going to be 200. Um, so unless I change you know, everything else that's around it, it's always going to look like that circle is in the middle of the can canvas, uh, since 200 is halfway between zero and 400. So if I want to create animation in motion, what I need is a variable so I can move that circle. Um, so I'm going to add in a variable. So I'll start with the variable x. And I'm going to put this in the global scope. And I'll go over y in a second. And I'm going to initialize it to be the current value that I have for my circle. So I'm just going to copy that and put it up there. And so now I have to replace x where that 200 is. And at first, nothing's going to change because we still have the same value. Um, so our ellipse is going to be drawn in the same place. But obviously, if I change this value, now I can change where the ellipse appears. So if I want to create some animation, I have to change the value within the program. So simple way to do that, I can just say x plus plus. So that's a shorthand, remember, for x equals x plus 1. So we're just adding 1 to x, and this is happening every single frame that we're drawing our, uh, our canvas. OK, so now we get motion. We have the animation. The x value of our circle is updating every frame. And since our program is running fast enough, it gives us the sense that it's moving. So a couple things to point out. So if we take out the background, we saw this with our interaction. It's hard to see because of the background of my uh, theme, but let's just draw the background once. So you can see all of the circles that are being drawn, and we're just replacing each circle in each frame. So let's bring this back. So the other thing that we have to be careful is where we declare our, vari our, our variable. So if I take this x and I put it here, my circle is not going to move anymore. And so that's because I'm declaring and initializing x uh, separately in the draw function than in my global scope. So even though I can Then the reason it stays in the same place is because we say x equals 
drug background examiner say X equals 200. So X just goes back to 200, it doesn't change. And even if I'm not declaring my variable here, if I just say X equals 200, if I'm just uh, assigning it a value, I have the same problem because I'm setting X to 200 every time I draw my canvas. So even though I'm incrementing X here, I'm resetting it to 200 uh, every time I draw. So that's why I need to have X here. So each time I call draw, this it doesn't rewrite this X value. I start with the X value and then draw increments it every time it runs. Okay, so we can also make X move faster. We can say X plus equals 10. Okay, so that's nice and fast. Say X plus equals five. And then the last bit we need to do is to reset our animation. So that's where our condition comes in. Um, okay, so here's where we can use our conditional statement. And this is, you know, we refer to conditional statements uh, and uh, if statements as control flow. We're control, controlling the flow of the program. So once my circle reaches a certain point, I want to set it back to the beginning. So I can say if x is greater than width. OK, so I know what the width of my canvas is, because p5 saves that, or that's the height, this 400, p5 saves that for me in the width variable. And so I'm incrementing x. x is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if x gets bigger than the width, that means my circle is somewhere over here. And so if that's the case for now, Let's just reset x to 0. So now I loop back to the beginning. So all I'm really doing is changing the number where x is being drawn. Slow it down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 375. Yeah, I see what you mean. So when it hits, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I can change that number. If I want to make the whole circle disappear, I could do, like, 425. So now it'll go all the way off before it reappears. And I could set x to negative 25 if I want it to go all the way through. Uh, but if I want to have it hit, you know, as soon as we get to the edge, we could reset it that way. So, yeah, we can put whatever numbers we want here to get the, the effect that we're looking for. All right, so let's keep going. Uh, any other questions? Does that make sense so far? Okay. Okay. So if we want to also animate the Y position, we can do the whole you know, same thing, except now we can use another variable. We can say variable Y also equals 200. We can draw the ellipse at X, Y. And then we can repeat the same process. Y plus equals 2. If Y is greater than, we can use 425 again y equals negative 25. So it's the exact same process. Oops, don't need a parenthesis there. And so now we'll get it on two dimensions. And my project is a square, which is why uh, it's going in a diagonal line. I could change the, the speed of one of them to make it go at different angles. I guess it's the same angle, but different parts of the square. So 
So it's basically the same setup. Okay, so we can also animate other properties besides the um, the uh, x and y. We can animate the size. So if I have a variable s for 50, that's the size. I could put s here. And s isn't changing, but if I want to increment s, I could say s++. plus plus. And now we get the size is changing. And I'm not doing anything to control it. It's just going to get bigger and bigger. So again, for this one, I don't, you know, I can just choose an arbitrary number because there's no, uh, you know, limit to how big I can make it. Like I have the boundaries of the canvas. So I could just say if S is greater than 100, S equals 50. So I could just reset it. So it's kind of like, pulsing as it goes. So the next part we have to look at is if we want to actually have the ball or whatever we have moving around bounce off of the walls instead of uh, going through the walls or the boundaries, whatever you want to call them. And so currently, I'm going to get rid of the size thing for a second and just focus on the x and y. So currently, all we're doing is we're setting that x value back to uh, negative 25 or zero, whatever you want it to be. Um, but we're always incrementing. So if we are always adding to x, we're always going to be moving to the right. And if we want to move to the left, what we would need to do is change this value to a negative number. So now we can have x go to the left. But if we want x to be able to go to the left and the right to change, then what we need is just like we have x, so we can change it when a condition occurs, we need a different variable that we can use to uh, change this speed when a different condition occurs. So we can use that. For that one, we're going to use the speed variable. So I'm going to say variable speed. And since we have x and y, I'm going to need one for both. So I'm going to say speed x. Set that to 2. And I'll say speed y and set that to 2 as well. So I'll start with x. So now instead of x plus equals negative 2, I'm going to say x plus equals speed x. And nothing's going to change here. It's just going to keep doing the same thing it was doing. But now instead of resetting x, what I can do is change the value of speed y. So I can say speed or sorry, speed x. And this one is a little bit tricky. Instead of, you know, resetting it to a number, I'm going to uh, invert it. I'm going to make it the opposite. So I can do that by multiplying it by negative 1. So I'm going to say speed x equals speed x times negative 1. And that works because if it's 2, it'll flip to negative 2. If it's uh, negative 2, it'll flip back to 2, right? If I multiply it by negative 1. OK, so now when we hit the side, we get that little bounce. We don't have it on the other side quite yet, but we're going to add that in in a second. And now we could change this back to 75 if we want to see it bounce from the edge. OK, so now we're getting the bounce off the right side, but we also need to know when we hit the left side. And so we can add in another condition here. And this is where it's useful to use our OR, uh, which is the two little types, the two vertical lines. Um, so OR means if either one of these things is true, then we're going to run our code. So these two little lines together make the OR sign. And you can get that. It's above the Enter key. And you just hold Shift and do the two lines. 
So if x is greater than 375 or x is less than uh, 25. So the width of the circle uh, on the left side. And let's turn y off for a second so we can just see this. Okay, so we bounce off the right and bounce off the left. So in the example, I was just using width. So if I just replace these with width and zero, you'll see it bounces from the middle of the circle. So as soon as it goes over that value or under zero, it just reverses the speed. And since we're using speed here, we don't have to change that x plus equals uh, value at all. So there's different ways that we could write this. This is the easiest way to write it, but you could also write a bunch of if statements like x plus equals versus x minus equals or something like that. Um, but this is probably the most efficient way to write it. Uh, so let's add on the y. Any questions before we do that? Okay. So for the y, we can do the same thing. y plus equals speed y. And same thing here, if y is greater than height or y is less than zero, then y, then speed y equals speed y times negative one. You can also write this in the same shorthand. You can say times equals, and it does the same thing as plus equals. It multiplies the original value by this number and then assigns it back to uh, that variable. Okay, so we need to change the uh, size of the canvas because it's just going to keep bouncing back and forth. So we make the canvas a little bit wider. And now we get that animation. Um, so another thing I want to change right now, if we want to make the circle bounce from the edge, we can do what Gal recommended, which is add. But what if we want to change the size of the circle or the size of the canvas? Then we need to use our size variable. So when we say x is greater than width, the circle is going to bounce from the middle of the circle, right? Because when we get the x of the circle, we should actually have a way to put the bonus points in below all of this stuff. Um, that would be slightly more accurate to calculate the position before uh, we draw the list. But anyway, when we bounce here, it's going to go from the middle. If we want to see it bounce from the head, then we have to move the time over a little bit. And what we can do is get the size of the circle and move it over by half, because we know the circle uh, size. Uh, is the whole diameter of the circle, uh, not the uh, not the radius. So I guess I could use like D for diameter instead of S for size. But anyway, so I can just add size divided by two. Or if I want to have another uh, variable, I could say variable R equals S divided by two and say that's the radius. So width plus R. And so now it'll bounce off the edge from the right side. Oh, whoops, I got to do minus our other direction. And so now if I change the size, if I make the circle 100 pixels, now I don't have to worry about updating the size because the variable will update with it. Right, and then on the other side, I need to add r uh, to 0. And 0 plus r is just r. And so I'm using width and height 
and zero because I want it to look like it's inside of the canvas. But it doesn't necessarily have to. You could have like if you had a sketch where you're doing like a TV inside of an of a you know bigger drawing, you could use the boundaries of that TV. Um, so let's add this to y as well. So height minus r and y is greater than or less than r, and we'll get it bouncing off each side. And so we're going to add one more, a couple more things to this, and uh, let's see, what else do we want to add to this? Uh, okay, we did the speed. Oh yeah, we want to add some randomness. Um, so another way to make kind of like unpredictability in your animation is to add a little bit of randomness. Um, and so I'm just going to show this sketch real quick. So in this sketch, you can see the ellipse is being drawn at x, y, and the x, y values are just changing randomly. So random is a function in P5 and in a lot of pro, uh, uh, programming where you can generate random numbers, so unpredictable numbers. And usually you have to give it some parameter. In this case, it's a, a range. So it's some random number between negative 5 and 5. But it's not always going to be 5 or negative 5. It's going to be something in the middle. And so if we want to add a little bit of you know, unpredictability to our sketch, we can add some randomness. So let's do that with the size. Um, so I'm actually going to put my ellipse at the bottom here. So I can, whoops, calculate the position before I actually draw it. It's probably not going to be that noticeable, but it's going to be slightly more uh, accurate. And then I'm going to randomize the size here. And I'm going to randomize the size before I calculate the position, because the position bouncing off the walls is based on what the size is. So if I say S, uh, or wait, no, R. Yeah, R for my radius. So R uh, equals, or let's do plus equals, random. Uh, I'm just going to do negative 1 or negative 2 to 2. Uh, it's not a big enough range. Let's try negative 5 to 5. Oh, because I'm not, I'm still drawing the ellipse at S. So I need to R times T. There we go. Okay, so now we can see it. So I was using the original S value, but that's not changing. The only thing that's changing is R. So I have to do R times 2 for radius times 2. And so now you can see the amount of uh, size change is due to this negative 5 to 5. If I want it to be less, I would do like negative 1 to 1. So now it just kind of looks like it's like wobbling a little bit. I could, if I offset to one size or another, it's going to eventually sort of move to that side. So if I put, you know, negative 2 to 2, it's going to go back and forth, but it's going to ultimately get bigger because the randomness is weighted towards the positive value. If I go the other direction, like negative 2 to 1, it's going to slowly get, or not even that slow, it's going to slowly get smaller. And then what it did actually there was inverted. Uh, if you give the size a negative value as the size for a shape, it's just going to turn it into a positive number. So with the randomness, we want more of a balance so that it stays in one kind of range. Maybe two is even too much. We could do negative oops, one to one. Okay. Um, so we'll look at random a bit more in depth in uh, our next project where we're going to do stuff with patterns. Um, but it's a useful thing for animation as well. Um, and you, it doesn't just have to be size. It could be color. It could be um, the speed. You could randomize the speed or the position.
Um, so we'll actually add to the uh, color as well. Okay, so we can also change the color. And I'm going to do something a little goofy here because it would make sense to change the color when the circle hits the sides, right? Uh, but I'm going to do it at a different rate, um, mostly just to demonstrate another way that we can do animation. Um, not because it's necessarily, you know, a good way to do it or the right way to do it. Um, these, the size is actually even, I can go even smaller than that. Let's do 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So it's not getting so far off. OK. So to choose a random color, um, we need some variables. Uh, so I'm going to make some random variables. I'm going to make uh, R, G, and B for red, green, and blue. And I'm going to initialize them using random. Um, and I'm going to do this in setup because the random function is a P5 function. So I can't use it up here in my global variables. Um, so I'm just going to declare red, green, and blue. I'll say uh, red, green, and I'm going to randomize these values in the setup function. I'm going to say r equals random. And I'm going to give it a range. With random, if I just put one number, the uh, minimum is implied to be 0. So writing random 255 is the same thing as writing uh, random 0 to 255. So if I say random 255, I'm going to get a random red value between 0 and 255. And remember from looking at RGP that 255 is the highest value. So there's no reason to go above that. So I'll get a random number uh, for red, a random number for green, and a random number for blue. Okay, and then I'm just going to do a fill. Oh, I'm going to run into an issue because I have two R's. So let's rename our radius RAD. So yeah, as you have more variables, you need to be a little more specific with the variable names or else you're going to run into problems. And I can't use red, green, and blue as variables because there's already functions called red, green, and blue, and it'll screw up the uh, P5 code, but that's okay. So I'm going to do RGB. And I'm not going to change it at first, but you will see that my circle is just going to be a random color each time I play the, uh, the, um, the scene. And let's turn off this stroke. We don't really need this stroke here. OK, so it would make sense to change the color. Uh, maybe we can do a few different color, color changes. So if I hit x, if I hit one of the walls, let's change red. Let's say red equals random 255. So this is another thing. I don't, my events, when I like run into stuff with these conditions, they don't necessarily have to change the thing that they're related to. I can change the color or the size or really do anything else I can do with my code. So now when we hit the wall, we should see the red value change. And so I'm not changing all three values, so it's kind of hard to see the difference, but you do see the difference a little bit. And right now it looks like I'm, oh, I'm stuck on the wall because the size is changing a lot. And so it's stuck between, uh, it's probably the size is getting a little bit bigger, so it's not bouncing, so it's just staying there. So uh, there's probably a smart way to fix that, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. So then let's change green uh, when we hit the top and the bottom. So I'm going to put g equals random 255 inside of this if statement when I hit the top or bottom. Let's put a comment here. Hit top or Hit right or left. And randomly change size. OK. So the last color that I'll change is the blue. And I'm going to use a different way of doing animation for this. 
um, mainly just, as I said, to give an example for that. So the thing that I'm going to use for that is a, uh, a math function called modulus or modulo. Um, and it's a little bit confusing, but it basically allows you to do timing and uh, do something at a specific interval um, in a convenient way. Um, so the modulo operator in JavaScript is just the percent sign. And what it tells you is the remainder of two values. Um, so if you remember remainder from division, if you divide one number by another, you know, it divides it up, but then there might be some left over. And that's what the modulo value is going to be. So if I do like one modulo one, there's no left over. One goes into one, one time. If I do, uh, you know, one modulo 10, um, I get one left over. Oh, it's because it's less than 10. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, if I do two modulo 10, yeah, let's do, okay, let's do 10 modulo two. And there, okay, so we get zero. So there's no left over. Um, but if I do like 11 modulo 10, I get one left over. If I do 12 modulo 10, I get two left over. Like 10 goes into 11 once, there's one left over. 10 goes into 12 once, there's two left over. Uh, if I do, you know, 32 modulo 10, it's still two. 10 goes into 32 three times, and you have two left over. And so that is convenient for doing things that we want to do at an interval. Um, so you can see this is just an example of uh, frame count, how, you know, the number of frames that is in the program versus frame count modulo 10. And you can see that frame count modulo 10 is just counting between 0 and 10 every 10 frames, even though the frame count keeps going up. Um, another example of that, just visualized. Here. So frame count is always going up as long as the program is running. But if we do frame count modulo 30, every 30 frames, we're going back to zero. And so we can use this for anim animation if we want to change every some something every 30 frames. So I'm going to use the frame count for this. Uh, so this is where I'll change my blue value. So I'll say if frame count modulo 30. So every 30 frames, it's half a second. So it's pretty often. Then uh, blue equals random 255. So you can see the color is actually changing a lot. Oh, I didn't actually finish writing the statement. Whoops. Equals. So we want to actually check if frame count modulo 30 equals zero. Because uh, that means that it's been 30 frames. Okay, so now this is what it should look like. So every half second, the blue value is changing. So the color changes when we hit the walls, but it's also changing on its own every half a second. And if I change this number to 60, it's just going to be every second. Um, another thing we could do is actually just like change the, the backgrounds. Maybe we could do that. Uh, Yeah, let's do that. So that way we can leave these guys the same. So I'm just going to put blue with green over here and bring this if statement up here. So let's do a different RGB for our background. So we'll do uh, background R. Oops. Background R background G, background B. And I'll just set these to zero because I don't want to initialize them in setup. So I'll just start with a black background. And then I'm just going to do the same thing before I draw the background. So I'm going to say R equals, uh, or background R equals random 255, background G equals random 255 background background b equals random 255 
And then I have to actually use those values. So I'll say background r is bgr, uh, g is bg g, and green is bg b. OK, so now our background is changing. But our circle changes only when we hit the canvas. I keep getting stuck on the side. So I'd have to figure out a way to fix that, but for now it's OK. OK, so these are mostly just to kind of demonstrate these different methods. You don't have to do them all at the same time, obviously. Um, and you can replace the circle with anything. It could be an image, it could be text, it could be multiple circles or you know multiple shapes. Um, you also don't have to do like a bouncing DVD scene. It could just animate across, or uh, we'll look at a few other ways to do animations on um, Wednesday as well. But this is the basic process for creating this type of you know repeated animation. Uh, you need a condition because you need to change the value when you, you know, arrive at that condition. So let's say this changes uh, background color every one second for 60 frames. Um, a couple other things, right now I'm just doing completely random colors, but you might wanna actually think about like what colors go well together. Maybe my circle should always be kind of blue and my you know uh, background should always be kind of orange or something like that so then i could change the values um, that i'm doing for the randomness uh, i could say you know this one only gets a hundred uh for red and so it's always going to be more on the um, green blue side or uh, my circle uh, only gets a hundred max for the green. So it's always going to be kind of on the blue-red side. So now you can see they're actually more similar in some cases, but yeah, different in others. So you don't have to use the full range of colors, um, just like you don't have to use like the full canvas, depending on what your idea is for the animation. Um, all right, I think that's enough info. Um, so on... Wednesday, we'll get transformation. And this is a, a different topic. It's it's a little bit, it makes things a little bit more tricky, but it also um, gives you a lot more to work with. Um, so we'll go over that on Wednesday. That's good for doing like rotations and uh, kind of skewing the canvas and doing things like that. Um, for now, uh, feel free to just play around with these uh, animation properties, see if you can take your logo slash meme project and add some animation into it, either if it's with the text or the image or both. Um, you could try playing around with different stuff. Um, and for this one, it doesn't have to be interactive, but if you want to continue using some interactivity, um, that is fine. Um, oh, I'm going to stop recording.